Nicole Kitchen. It had been a good year for Nicole Kitchen going into the fall of 2003. She'd come a long way. She had turned childhood challenges into personal strengths with the help from a dedicated mother, loving family, and strong devotion to her faith and to her church community. At 10 years old, she moved into one of Chicago's notorious high-rise housing projects called Harrison Courts, located at California and Harrison Avenue on Chicago's west side with her mother. Growing up in the challenging environment didn't hold her back. By the time she was attending Marshall High School, she had secured a job with a housing authority in a city program designed to provide opportunities for city youth. Nicole began working with the heating and cooling engineers in the housing project where she lived. She watched, learned fast, and saw an opportunity. She continued in the job after high school while taking classes or college courses at Kennedy King Community College. When she, when she went to work one day and learned that the program was ending and she was going to lose the job, she decided to act on the opportunity she had envisioned. With help from her family and the contacts she had made in the job, she started her own contracting company, Exciting Ventures. She started working with contractors and bidding on jobs. She learned quickly that if she were organized, budgeted correctly, and hired people she trusted and that could do the work they promised, she could thrive. She learned how the city awarded contracts and bid on them accordingly. It was a lot of work, but she was good at it, and she enjoyed being her own boss. She was busy, but never too busy, to stay closely involved with her church. The Joshua Missionary Baptist Church, located on the 3200 block of West Carroll Avenue, led by longtime pastor C.L. White, was Nicole's home away from home. She sang in the choir, sat on the finance committee, and volunteered her time with young mothers, pregnant women, and children in the congregation. In early summer 2003, she received notification that she had been awarded a contract she had bid on with the city. It had seemed like an impossible dream, but she knew the $2 million contract award would be a challenge to fulfill after the initial elation. She had her ducks in a row, however, and was confident she was up to the task. Most importantly, the money she netted from the project would afford her the ability to give her mother and family real comfort and security. At 34 years old, Beautiful by all accounts, successful, and loved by her family and her community, she was on her way. Perhaps the only thing missing was a partner to share her life with. Even that seemed to change when a visiting pastor to her church gave a moving sermon about his return to grace after drug use, crimes, and prison. They talked after the services that day, and a connection was made. His name was John E. Taylor, Jr., Hello, and welcome back to the Detective Story Podcast. I am Mike Hammond. I hope you're well. I appreciate you jumping back in. On the 14th of October, 2003, about 8 p.m., my partners and I received a call from our sergeant in Area 4 Violent Crimes. He told us that 11 district patrol officers were on the scene of a potential homicide in the 2400 block of West Lexington Street on Chicago's west side. The female victim had been transported to Mount Sinai Hospital, but was not expected to survive. The sergeant said he was, he was sending an assist team of detectives to the hospital to check on the victim's condition, but the case was ours. So we drove to the scene and found a building to be a newer three-story condominium building in the middle of the block. We were directed by patrol officers who were guarding the scene to the third floor. We were met there by multiple members of the kitchen family in obvious emotional distress. Though upset and concerned, they composed themselves remarkably quickly and told us this story. I'll paraphrase their statements in the interest of time, as they were all consistent and similar. They related that their daughter, niece, cousin, Nicole Kitchen, had been recently married to a man named John Taylor, whom she had met in their church. They had gone on a honeymoon to St. Petersburg, Florida recently, but it had not gone well. Taylor was arrested for domestic violence there after assaulting Nicole. Nicole had not pursued the charges against Taylor, but had immediately flown home by herself 
and told her mother that it was not going to work between her and Taylor. On the day of our involvement in this case, they reported that at 6.50 p.m., John Taylor had arrived at the kitchen household. Nicole's mother, Florence, had gone to the store about 20 minutes before and was not home at the time, although she was there by the time we arrived on the scene. Her uncle and great-uncle were in the living room alone about to watch a baseball game when John Taylor rang the buzzer for their unit. They looked out and saw him and then called out to Nicole and told her that Reverend Taylor, as they called him, was at the door. They noted he was wearing a shirt and tie. Nicole came out and got him and they went back into Nicole's bedroom. While they were in the bedroom, Nicole's cousin and her cousin's 18 and 16-year-old daughters arrived at the apartment. The kitchen family heard a commotion in the bedroom and asked each other if Nicole had screamed. But knowing they were newlyweds, they were reluctant to interfere, thinking they were either hashing it out or maybe making up. A short time after hearing the commotion, Taylor came out of Nicole's bedroom. The family reported that he seemed calm, but was nowhere, no longer wearing the tie, and his shirt was open and untucked. They also noted that he had no visible signs of injury, and he spoke to them as if everything was okay, even asking the 18-year-old niece how her college applications were going. They did note that he seemed rushed and walked right toward the door, and before leaving said, I'm leaving, she is asleep, nodding back toward Nicole's door. The uncle looked out of the front window and saw that Taylor seemed to be hurrying and did not close the iron fence gate behind him. He reported to us that they were immediately concerned and knocked on Nicole's door but got no answer. They tried to open it but found it locked. So they got a paper clip and picked a lock and went inside. When they entered the bedroom, they discovered Nicole unconscious, lying at an odd angle on her bed. They noted that she had urinated in her sweatpants and had a red mark across her neck. She was unresponsive to their voices or touch. The uncle began performing CPR, and her cousin called 911. The police and a Chicago Fire Department ambulance arrived, and the paramedics took Nicole away. My partners and I later learned that Nicole was taken to Mount Sinai Hospital in Chicago, where she was pronounced dead on arrival. We also learned the next day, Cook County Medical Examiner's Office conducted an autopsy on Nicole Kitchen and determined the cause of her death to be ligature strangulation. They also noted that Nicole had external injuries to her face, neck, arms, and thigh, petechial hemorrhaging to her eyes, and internal injuries to her neck and scalp, and bite marks on her tongue caused by her own teeth. They deemed her death a homicide. A note about all that. You'll often hear me refer to the medical examiner's report or their initial autopsy report with the closure cause and manner. And it is as it sounds, but just to be clear, cause is exactly that, what they determined to be the cause of the death, in this case, ligature strangulation. And then the manner is what they rule the case, in this case, a homicide, and most that we worked on. And they had other manners that they would assign or determine, accidental deaths, suicides, natural deaths, a litany of them. And sometimes those things were would change or indeterminate based on further investigation and, and um, things like uh, medical lab reports, stuff like that. But in general, when you hear me talk about cause and manner, that's what I'm talking about. Just to go a little further, ligature strangulation means as it sounds. Some piece of thin material, like a rope or a belt, or yes, possibly a tie, was used to choke her. The National Library of Medicine defines petechial hemorrhaging as small pinpoint hemorrhages generally seen and looked for in the lining of the eyes in the conjunctiva, careful saying that word, either that of the lids, which is called the pul pulpebrial conjunctiva, or the bulbar, the covering of the bulb of the eye, and generally are the sign of terminal asphyxia. So you can see, after many, many years of doing this, and many, many autopsies, I still struggle with <laughs> some of those medical terms. I'm not a doctor. So in real talk, what are we talking about here? All right, so petechial hemorrhaging is something I saw quite often. 
it's a medical way of describing blood vessels that are broken in the eyes. Broadly, it's caused by the cutoff of oxygen to the brain pretty quickly. Most seen by us, obviously, in strangulation cases. Her other injuries were of note, but I'll get to that a little bit later. As you can surmise, we were immediately on the hunt for John Taylor. We did learn that Taylor had been imprisoned in the state of Virginia for 49 years for a series of convenience store robberies. While in prison there, he had petitioned the parole board for early release after drug and alcohol treatment, prison ministry, and the support of the Chicago Baptist community where he had grown up. Baptist leaders here wrote letters to the Virginia Parole Board on his behalf. Though he had not been eligible for parole until 25 years into the 49-year sentence, he was indeed paroled to the state of Illinois after just five years in a Virginia prison. The parole did come with a caveat that should he violate his parole in any way, he still owed the state of Virginia at least 20 years. We also learned in their investigation that during the honeymoon in St. Petersburg, Florida, as described by the family, a passing security guard doing his rounds at the hotel where they were staying heard what he thought was fighting in their room. He later would tell police he heard Nicole begging for Taylor not to hit her. The security guard had the police summoned when he heard the disturbance, and they arrived, saw that Nicole was scratched up and upset, and arrested Taylor on domestic violence charges. Taylor, knowing his parole in Virginia could be violated, begged Nicole not to pursue the charges against him. Nicole consented at the time and signed her refusal to prosecute, but as the family told us, she immediately flew back to Chicago on her own. In letters to Nicole that were later turned over to us, written by Taylor, he continued to beg Nicole not to, or I'm sorry, to contact the state's attorney's office in St. Petersburg, Florida, and assure them it was a misunderstanding and that she did not wish to pursue charges against him. He was clearly concerned that the state of Virginia would get wind of the charges. So I'll get into the rest of the, the investigation in a moment. First, though, let's give Nicole her due, and let me introduce the very closest person to Nicole, her mother, Florence Kitchen. Miss Florence agreed to speak with me for this podcast. So let her describe to you the person that Nicole Kitchen was. She grew up, I just started here, she grew up in public housing, Chicago public housing. Yeah, you guys Uh, were over there at Sacramento and Harrison, right? Yeah, we moved there when she was like about 10 years of age. Uh Uh-huh. And she went to the grammar school over there at Jensen. And uh, she went to Marshall High School. And uh, after school, she would always have a a job, after school job. Even when she um, graduated from high school, she had an after school job. And then CHA, they had a program called the Step Up Program, and she entered into that. And went to school, uh, I think it was Kennedy King, and graduated from there and got her degree in electronic and, uh, what is electronic and, uh, wait, well, numerous things like uh, electronic tile rebuilding and demolition and stuff like that. Oh, like contracting type of thing. Yeah, contracting, mm-hmm. yeah. And then she uh, got a little disappointed because the <laughs> The job went one way, and she wanted to go the other way. Like, they had told her, well, okay, you're going to have to take a janitor job. And she said, oh, no, a janitor job, Mama, I can't do that, I can't do that. I said, well, just hold on. You know you got the skills, something to come up. So it did. Uh, she got into her own business. Yeah, she started, uh, if I remember right, she started, like, uh, she figured out how to kind of general contract jobs herself. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, she had to do uh, contracting and she had asked me, Mama, I wonder what I should name my company. And we sat down and sat down, and she thought about it. She said, I know we'll name it Excited Venture Decorating Corporation. And that's what she did. Excited Venture? Exciting Venture okay. Decorating okay. Corporation. Yeah, I have, she, I have cards now. That's so awesome. What a great name. Uh-huh. And she uh, stayed on the job and, you know, did real good. She always was there for me and my mom, my mother, she was sick at the time. But she was always there for us. She had met John Taylor at our church, which I didn't go to church, I think that week or whatever. And uh, she met him and she said, Mama, I'm gonna bring him so you can meet him. I said, okay. 
So I did meet him, and, you know, he was like, okay. You know, I <laughs> thought he was okay because this is something that I wanted for her to have a husband and children. And that's what she was looking forward to doing because she always would – She's a good role model for my little nieces and nephews and stuff. She would always buy them clothes and take them places and do a lot of things for all the kids. And uh, she wanted to in her own. And she met him and everything turned around different. If I, am I mistaken in my memory here, but it, it seems like when she started that contracting company, like she, she knew she had learned in her CHA job how, you know, by talking to contractors and that kind of how the process worked and how she could bid on some of those CHA jobs. was Is that correct? Or? Yes, because she was awarded a $2 million job. Yeah, that's what I thought. I, I remember she, talking to you about that back in the day. Mm-hmm. That's that's amazing, really amazing. But she was sounds like she was great with her nieces and nephews. and Oh, yeah, she was good with them, even in the church. You know, people... Yeah. Kids in the church, you know, she named a couple of kids in the church, you know, when they was born. And stuff. Wow, that's amazing. She was in the choir, good choir singer. So was the church, the church kind of her social life? Oh, yes, uh-huh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she was loved by many, you know, she always had a big smile on her face, whether she was having a bad day or a good day, you know. Not just a number in one of the 600 murders in Chicago in 2003 but an amazing woman who had risen from poverty, small opportunity chances, and long odds to be a successful business owner, respected member of her community, provider, and protector of her family. So beloved that pregnant women with whom she spent time in her church named their children after her. A real shining light, an example of the possibilities despite the challenges that life might hand you. So now back to our investigation. We had an address for Taylor, which was his father's address, actually, in Dalton, Illinois, which was about 20 miles from where we were at on the scene. And we were concerned that if he was there, he wouldn't be for long. So we called ahead to the Dalton police and asked them to go by the address, giving them a description of Taylor and see if he was there. They reported back that they had gone by and his father was there, but Taylor was not. So we went to the location and spoke to his father. He stated that his son, John Jr., had called him at home on the telephone and told him he had killed Nicole and was going to kill himself. His father, a minister of some respect himself, reported to us that he had told his son that if he killed Nicole, he better not show up at his home. I'll tell you, it's just my opinion, but I believe the man. He was not pleased. So for the next 48 hours or so, we searched the city in every possible location we could come up with for John Taylor with no success. Two days after the murder, however, we received a call from Florence Kitchen, who told us she had gotten a call from John Taylor, Jr. Taylor told Miss Florence that he was sorry he had killed Nicole and was going to kill himself. Immediately after the call, Miss Florence called us and told us about the phone call. We reached out to the FBI and asked for their assistance in locating the origination of the telephone call. The FBI pretty quickly got back to us, told us that the call originated from a payphone in Cleveland, Ohio. With the knowledge that he had fled our jurisdiction, we sought and were granted an arrest warrant for John Taylor. As we knew he was likely still out of state, we reached out to our Fugitive Apprehension Unit and requested a UFAP which is a synonym for an unlawful flight to avoid prosecution warrant. Our fugitive apprehension officers are Chicago policemen, but they work in a task force with United States Marshals, who are federal agents, obviously, and they have the ability, and only federal agents do, to seek this UFAP warrant, which is a federal warrant, and if granted, gives all federal law enforcement agents jurisdiction to find and arrest a subject, in this case, John Taylor. So we continued the process of putting together the case for prosecution against Taylor while attempts were made to locate him. Our efforts there mostly consist of collecting the numerous phone messages from reverends and ex-girlfriends around the city, all of whom called us to report he had confessed to Nicole's murder on their voicemails. Included in this group was a 19-year-old young lady who had been impregnated by Taylor after meeting and engaging in a relationship after one of his sermons. This is a good place to hear from Miss Florence again, 
as she describes the deterioration of the man they had believed John Taylor to be leading up to Nicole's murder. I think that's what happened with my daughter and him. You know, he was like a manipulator. He was like everything that wasn't right. But, you know, she just, I just couldn't see it because, you know, sometimes we get caught up in the religion thing and we don't, uh, I mean, we could be fooled by the very elect. And that's what happened to her, I think, because he was always talking about God and the Bible and, you know, stuff like that. And sometimes you get brainwashed into them situations. I think that's what happened. No, I, yeah, and, and look, I'll be very honest with you. It wasn't just Nicole that he fooled. He, he had he had a lot of people fooled, all, all of these ministers. I talked to many of them that he had dealt with in Chicago um, after the fact, and and they were not happy with him either. I mean, they felt like, you know, they also felt like they'd been kind of uh, played, you know, and, um, and they were very, especially when, you know, they kind of got word from Reverend White, what a special person Nicole was. And then they all, so they couldn't have been more cooperative with us. I mean, they, it, with, with me and my partners, they, they just were, you know, whatever you need, whatever. Cause he was calling them actually making confessions to them that he had hurt Nicole and all these things. And, yeah. uh, so they were all, um, you know, I won't lie. My, it might have been somewhat self-serving from them because they wanted to distance themselves. Uh, I don't think that was true with Reverend White. I think he was genuinely just kind of upset and fooled by him. Um, and because, like you said, I think he he had known Nicole a long time and and was really wanting her best interest. It always seemed to me when I talked to him, anyway. Um, yeah. But he he fooled. He he just fooled a lot of people and yes, uh, I had talked with him uh, I had kept in contact with Tasha did you remember Tasha I the don't know I'm sorry maybe by she testified in court I oh that's right yeah she Tasha did Jones. yeah because yeah, he called and he confessed to her too yes I do remember yeah, uh-huh. yeah. I think it was you and I talking about this or maybe it was one of maybe it was one of her cousins or somebody but I know that so in my head, what happened, they get married, everything's fine. And then they went to Florida on her honeymoon and she told you, I think, or maybe somebody else I talked to, you correct me if you're wrong, that when, when they got to the hotel, he just like flipped out and became a different person, told her, you know, look, oh, yeah. you, you can't own your yeah. own business. No wife of mine will own her own business. You can't dress like that. And, and, yeah, because he had told, I mean, she had called me from when they went on the honeymoon, she had called me and, uh, I had a contact person because, you know, we was letting them have fun and everything. So I had a contact person. I think it was uh, some preacher from Sweetport, Louisiana, I believe it was. I can't even think of the name right now. Uh-huh. But anyway, I couldn't reach him. So finally I did reach her. So she said, Mama, I'm coming home. I said, well, what's wrong? You don't sound too good. She said, I'm coming home. I can't be here with this man, Mama. And I said, okay. And so he had got locked up. Yeah, she had him arrested for. She had gotten into it in the in the hotel, and he had she had got locked up, and they let him out, or she told him to let him out, or something. I don't know how that went, but anyway, when she got home, I met her at the airport. She wasn't herself at all. My mother at that time she was sick, and her brother was here from Memphis and California here with her, and the uncle and I from California decided to go to the store after we picked up from the airport. And I said, come on, Nikki, go to the store with us. We're going to get some fish and stuff. She said, no, Mom, I don't want to go. She said, when you get back, I got something to tell you. I said, okay. She said, I'm serious. I'm going to tell you everything, Mom. I said, okay. And when we got back, it, you know, it, that was it. You know, she was gone when I got back. Yeah. And my niece said that they were in the car, in the house. My brother literally remember him. Yeah, sure, I remember him. They were all in the house. I think it was about three people in the house, and my mother was in the bed sick. Yeah. And my niece said he had came in, rang the doorbell, and they never seen him dressed like that before because he always wore a suit, you know. But uh, yeah. she said he had on all black clothes and a black cap, and he went back in my daughter's room, and. Uh, she said about maybe 20 minutes they heard something boom, boom, like that, you know. Yeah. And said, she said, oh, something is going on. So my brother said, no, let Nikki rest. She's probably tired, you know. And my niece said, she said, no, uh-uh, because he came out the room, and she said he met her in the hallway and said, oh, what college are you going to? You're getting ready to graduate. And he went on out the door. And they goes in there, and he had locked her up in the door. Yeah. So she said she was banging on the door, and she... Got, they got a knife, I think, or something, opened the door. And he had strangled her and covered her up. 
Yeah, yeah. And yeah. left out the door. And so when I came from the store, I'm thinking it was my mom because they only gave her a couple of days or a week to live. And my niece said, oh, no, it's my grandma. It's Nikki. It's Nikki. You know, I'm like, Nikki. And when I got up there, they had told me about it. And I just got, went out of it for a while, you know, a long sure, time. Yeah. yeah, I didn't even go to the mall to identify her body. I only saw her when I took her clothes to the funeral home for the viewing of the body, you know. No, but it was something that she really wanted me to know, you know. Yeah. And he said, oh, no, he's not the man. Oh, mama, oh, no, I'm going to tell you about him. But she didn't get a chance to tell me about it, you know. Yeah. Because uh, he had tried to start isolating her from her friends and stuff like that. And she was kind of picking on to, I mean, picking up on what he was doing, you know. But he was like a little bit ahead of her, you know. Right. But yeah, she that's... knew it wasn't right for her. She knew it. And I appreciate you guys, you know. I know you do. I know you do. And, uh, you know, we're we're doing our job, but, but I know and that... it was a good thing, you know. I was thinking when it happened, I said, oh, they don't take a long time before they find this man, you know, but y'all had found him real quick. So, he had shown his true colors, and Nicole was not about to put up with it. Miss Florence had had her own reservations, as you heard, but did what most of us would do, probably, and deferred to her daughter's good judgment. Unfortunately, Nicole agreed to meet with Taylor one more time for reasons known only to her. So it shakes out like this. First, yours truly here, not sleeping for several days as we were working the scene and then searching for Taylor and doing all the things that you really need to do in that first 48 to 72 hours after a case, especially when the you have a hot suspect who you know is the killer out there, I caught pneumonia. So I was out of the box for a few days. My partners, having a much stronger constitution than I did, kept the investigation up and learned that the FBI had located John Taylor in Charlottesville, Virginia. Virginia, of all places. Still makes me shake my head. Why go back to Virginia? I, I still don't know the answer to that. But what I do know is after a six-hour standoff with law enforcement at the hotel, Taylor was taken into custody. Now, as I said before, you know, I'm, without permission, and especially if they're still working, I, I'm not going to name the officers and agents that I worked with. In my mind, it's just not the right thing to do. Um, in general, everybody that I name has agreed to this or has been convicted of some crime or is on the public record in some way. But having said all that, an excellent and savvy FBI agent that we had known and gotten to know better during this case was on the scene when Taylor was taken into custody and eventually spoke to him. Taylor gave him a statement and admitted to killing Nicole, as he had to many others, but just in much deta more detail. Extradition was granted, or maybe he agreed to it, I don't recall now. Either way, my partners flew out to Virginia and brought John Taylor back to Chicago. He was subsequently charged with Nicole's murder. I will say it is an interesting side note here. When my partners interviewed him, he basically admitted, yes, I killed Nicole and I got to live with it. But he, interestingly enough, he asked them if he would describe the difference between first, second, and third degree murder. An odd thing for a suspect to ask, but just thought I'd mention it. During the trial that was subsequently held, Nicole's family did a great job of testifying on her behalf and laid out an excellent case that was masterfully handled by two excellent state's attorneys. Taylor was represented by two attorneys from the Public Defender's Office. And I'll say here, too, the Public Defender's Office catches a lot of flack. It's a tough gig. It just is. There's a lot going on there, and they deal with a lot. But it's my experience in the murder division, especially, they have some very competent attorneys. And John Taylor had two very good ones. One is now a judge, and the other is in private practice. And I'll tell you, though we are all the other sides of the, the spectrum here, if you're in a jam, you'd be happy to have him representing you on your side. They were matched up against two of the state's best attorneys as well. Public defenders were hampered greatly, though, by their client, John Taylor, who was not only clearly guilty, he had his own plan to take the stand and try and con his way out of it. His testimony is a matter of public record. But I'll tell you, it's my personal opinion. It was just pathetic. 
He claimed on the stand that he'd visited Nicole to try and reconcile, but she became hostile and attacked him. Now remember, well, I haven't mentioned it, so you wouldn't know, but I'll say you now. John Taylor is 5'11", between 210 and 220 pounds, and Nicole was more like 5'3", 5, 5'4", five, and about 130 pounds, just for reference point. But he also claimed Nicole made very inappropriate sexual comments that infuriated him, and at one point she scratched, punched him, and tried to strangle him with his own tie. He claimed that he fought to pull the tie away from her, and it became entangled around her neck. As he tried to pull it away from her, she passed out, his words, and he left. As you can guess, the state's attorney had a field day on cross-examination with the inconsistencies in Taylor's testimony. Most damning, of course, was the family's very consistent and resolute testimony about Taylor walking out of the room without any apparent injury, making casual small talk, stating that Nicole was asleep, and then hustling off the property without telling them that she needed aid or anything was wrong at all. I mentioned that I would get back to her injuries as reported by the medical examiner. She had multiple injuries to her face, head, and body. Most telling and disturbing was that she had nearly bitten through her tongue. At trial, an assistant medical examiner, coroner in most places, we call medical examiners here in Chicago, reviewed records from Nicole's autopsy report and testified that her death was homicide by strangulation. She had marks on her neck, which extended from earlobe to earlobe and resulted from full frontal pressure. The assistant medical examiner also testified that a person loses consciousness after blood has been cut off to the brain after about 10 to 30 seconds. And death from strangulation can occur in about three and a half to six minutes. If you even do a cursory search online, you'll find those numbers are widely accepted in the medical field. So what's that all mean? It means Nicole was unconscious in a matter of less than a half a minute, fighting for air so hard she nearly bit through her own tongue and her bladder released. She would have been limp, unconscious, and no threat to anyone after that. Three minutes then after, at least to cause death or permanent brain damage. Three minutes doesn't sound like much, but I challenge you to pause this podcast and set a timer for that time. Unless you're driving, of course, and do it later, please. Three minutes. That's the minimum time that Taylor held that ligature around Nicole's neck hard enough where she could not get air or blood to her brain. All the time, she was lying, unable to defend herself in any way. Like Miss Geneva in our last episode with Alvin Jones' hands wrapped around her neck. I apologize, especially to Miss Florence for being so descriptive, but I want it to be clear. This was not a self-defense issue and never could have been. John Taylor purposely and with intent murdered Nicole Kitchen after causing other injuries, maybe out of anger at a refusal to take him back, maybe out of jealousy, or maybe to ensure that she could not change her mind and pursue charges in Florida thereby sending him back to prison in Virginia for a minimum of 20 years after making clear to him that the relationship between them was over. Whatever the case, the jury agreed and found him guilty of first-degree murder. The judge sentenced him to the maximum penalty for a murder not involving a gun of 60 years. An appellate court later heard the case and agreed as well, affirming his conviction. For Florence Kitchen... It brought some closure, knowing he would never hurt another person, but not a great deal of relief from her pain, at least for some time. But I'll let her explain that. So I told Pastor Frank, I said, okay, he was in Joliet at the time. I said, okay, you can pick me up. This has been about 10 years ago or more. And he said, if you get there and feel any kind of way uncomfortable, just let me know and we'll leave, you know. Right. And I said, okay, because he didn't go in there, you know, with me to see Taylor. So I went there. And sat at the table, you know, and uh, I looked at him, and he looked at me, and I went to ask him why did he do that, but something inside of me told me, no, don't ask him that. And so when we sit down at the table, he looked at me, and he said, I am so sorry I hurt you so bad. He said, would you please forgive me? And I said, yes. I said, I forgive the way you acted. 
I said, you did something that you shouldn't have did, and I forgive you for doing that. I said, but God will help you out the rest of the way. And he said, thank you so much, and I left. And I felt good after that. You know, I really felt all the uh, anger and all this kind of stuff was on me, burdening me down. It seemed like it was lifted off of me at that point. Yeah, I just had to look at his face. You know, I just yeah. had to look at him. No, I understand that, and I'll tell you, it yeah. takes a lot of courage on your part. Yeah, it did. Part. It really did. But I'm trained, you know. I'm like, I gotta go see this man. So Pastor Frank said, "Come on and go see him. You know, you feel better." Huh. And I did. I, I felt a lot better. I could go on. You know, it was a piece of my life that I could kind of lay for a minute and just go on to the next page of my life, chapel or whatever. You know, because it was terrible for me. It was really bad. No, I, I just can't you know, imagine. Bad. I just can't yeah. imagine. But I, I mean, didn't know. I didn't know what to do or what I was going to. I didn't know anything. You know, but I yeah. thank God that I know God. You know, because He's able. He really helped me through it, you know. Many people did, you know, church people, family and stuff. No, I, uh, yeah, it's it's an amazing story. I had no idea that you had gone to visit him. I just, uh, I gotta, I gotta tell you that uh, I really admire your courage to do that and to face him and uh, and to and to kind of give him your forgiveness. I, uh, I, 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 I had to do that. Yeah, I had to do that. You know, that was something I knew I had to do in order to live on myself because I couldn't keep on living with all this. Uh, he did this and this and that, and you know, I couldn't do that. So I gave him for his heinous act, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that makes you a really, really good human being, first of all. And and also, I mean, I, I admire your faith. I, I, I got to be honest with you, I've seen so many really terrible things. I struggle with, you know, mm-hmm. believing that God has a hand in any of it. But it's yeah. but I admire people of faith a great deal. And, mm-hmm. I you know, to be able to do what you did there is is just amazing and and I can see how it can bring you some peace but when in cases like this you know it's to me there's there's no if god wants to forgive him after he's gone that's okay with me and you forgive him i think's a great thing uh but to me uh, you know he doesn't need my forgiveness he just i just don't want him back on the street ever again he's 90 right. years old right. i don't care you yeah. know what i mean i know that sounds harsh and oh uh, he don't need to be back on the street at all <laughs> yeah. yeah oh i just focus on uh her, you know, it was a, a strange thing, you know, because at one point, I don't you know, I guess I was kind of doing losing it or something, because I used to think about imagining things, you know, I used to like imagine that sure. she had children and I had grandkids and stuff like that, and I used to sit and imagine it a whole lot, and I saw, oh, I got to pray on this, and I started praying on it, and then it got real good easy for me and I love to cook and bake and stuff and like even now when I cook dinner or something special I always think about her coming in and eating and stuff like that and she loved the nice things and she always has a story to tell me about the, her day and stuff you know and I miss that I used to sit in the living room and uh, about 5 o'clock in the evening I'm sitting there waiting to the key you know hit the door I saw my god I thought you know it was just it was really messed up for me at that point yeah it really was. I couldn't focus on. Well, I was just say I started focusing on um, the very, very good things. I think maybe about ten years after. Oh. Yeah, I started just knowing that when she got older, she would have got a house, you know, and just you yeah. know, just live a life like she did. But she loved to travel. She had been a lot of places, you know, and did a lot of things, you know. Yeah. And I knew she was going to continue to do that and reach out and help family. She had plans to help family members, you know, because she had, um, I think about three of our family members, she had them employed in her company. Oh, I see. And she was planning on helping a lot of people to church, and she just talked about so much of stuff, you know, what we're going to do, Mama, you know. And, right. and, you know, it was it's just I had to get past that, you know. Yeah, yeah, well, and I tell now, you that. I, I she loved to take pictures, and I had set myself up. I guess I put a lot of photographs over a spot in my house, and I couldn't take that. They had a party for her after death. I couldn't take that, and it was a long time before I could just sit a picture of her out and look at it, you know. But yeah. now I got a couple of pictures around here of her, and I look at them and I talk to her, you know, and stuff like. But it's it's easy now, you know. It hurts. It still hurts, but. 
it's a little bit easy. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. I mean, I know that it does still hurt, but I, it's amazing to me that you've been able to kind of accomplish those things mentally. And I know you, you, your faith has a lot to do with that. I, it's it's really a testament also to how strong you, of a person you are. And, and clearly you passed that to Nicole. I mean, I, it's, um, I, I, it's, it makes me happy to hear that. Yeah, she was always loving me, always, because she knew that I took, I worked for the Board of Education for years, and I took care of her alone myself, you know, and she always said, Mommy, when I get older, I'm going to take care of you, and she was doing exactly what she said she was going to do. Yeah. She was so sweet, so sweet to me, you know, always looked after me. Uh, well, good for you. I'm so I'm so glad to hear that, because... You know, I, I I think about you, and and I think about the, the a lot of the families I dealt with over the years, and you know, I don't I have to tend to my own mental health, right? So I don't yeah. I, I don't dwell on things, and I don't let myself get too far down that road of worrying or things. But I do think about you, and and this podcast that my daughter pushed me to do, I part of the reason that I've enjoyed working on it, it so much is exactly this, like because you know I think that uh, Nicole is the type of person, and there are others that should be remembered by people, you know. Yeah, so, and I'm so happy that you, you know, uh, called me on this. You know, it was surprising when my niece had called me and I saw my, and it's good, you know, and I'm, I thank you for doing it. Well, it's my pleasure. I, I, you know, when I started doing this, I realized that, you know, because you build build kind of relationships with, with families like you when you're doing these things, and it's a very odd kind of situation, right, because, you know, we're not good news, unfortunately. We're just trying to do a job and, and get answers, but, but we, you still end up building some relationships and um, and so when I started this kind of project and I started, I recorded some and then I thought to myself, you know what, I, I need to reach out to these families. I don't, I'm not going to put this out there to the world without you guys knowing, you know, uh, because um, it just didn't seem right to me. And also it's just another good reason for me to to see how you're doing. And, and I'm, it really warms my heart to to know that you're in a pretty good place. I know you you miss her and it's still very hard, but uh, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you you have you've gotten to a yeah. place, you know, where you place where I could get used to living the way I live. Now, it's a whole different turn that I've taken, you know, sure. in life itself. You know, you have to, like, uh, do do it all different. And it was kind of hard for me, but from the grace of God, I'm doing good. You know, God is still blessing me. I'm 71 years old and happy, doing good. For the rest of her family, community, and all of us as a whole, Nicole Kitchen was a light that shone so brightly in a community that desperately needed the illumination. When we lose someone like her, her, it leaves a permanent mark. A loss so great that it can never be fully quantified. What starts out as a number in a homicide book in Area 4 expands exponentially as you understand who she was and what she meant. What she could have been and the people she may have impacted given the fullness of her time. But you play the long game, right? Miss Florence, her family, her community, myself, and my partners will not forget Nicole. I hope now you will give her a thought occasionally too. If you do, that light will continue to glow, is my belief. As for John Taylor, he sits in the Illinois Department of Corrections. He is eligible for parole in September of 2063. Born in 1962, he will be 101 years old. Of course, he still owes the state of Virginia 20 years. Contrary to how it may seem, I don't live with anger and thoughts of vengeance. With all these cases, it would just be too exhausting. I really don't. So if he lives to the age of 121 and has paid his debt to Miss Florence in the state of Virginia, I'm all good with him walking out of prison. Once again, I have some acknowledgments that I owe. First, of course, to Miss Florence Kitchen. She was happy to talk to me, but reluctant to hear her voice in a recording. It is an odd thing, Miss Florence, I agree. As you can tell, I'm still trying to figure it out. But with the encouragement of her awesome family, yeah, I'm looking at you, Tara, she agreed to be on this podcast. I'm so grateful that she did and that you guys got to hear her voice. You're an incredibly brave woman and an inspiration to everyone who has suffered great trauma. It means a great deal to me that you agreed to take part. I wish you nothing but peace and happiness for you and your family the rest of your days. Also, though this is only episode two, I want to thank everyone who's reached out and been so supportive. It's really been 
an awesome thing to see. It means a great deal to me. And I'll continue to try and improve my delivery here and give you worthwhile content. So that's all I got for today. Please, if you're enjoying these stories, please like and download, subscribe, all those things I'm supposed to ask for. We are all over the social media, so please give us your feedback. Good, bad, whatever. I can take it. We will be back. Until then, stay safe and watch out for each other.